Jay Gudev, welcome. Today we're going to speak about Swami Samarta of Akalkot. It's actually a great pleasure and also honor to speak about such a great saint, um, especially on this auspicious day of Katyaini Devi, which is also related to Brihaspati, to Jupiter, which is the day of the Guru. So to speak about Samarta Swami, which is a very great Guru tradition, uh, is really nice. So before I start or oh, to speak about Swami Samarta of Akalkot, um, one thing, questions, unless it's something which you don't understand during the lecture, we take after the lecture, okay? And I was asked not to move too much, so I will try to keep in my limits. To speak about Swami Samarta, we have to get back to the very origin, which is the Tatreya. So, as you know, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Yada, Yada, Hi Dharmasya, Klanir Bhavati Bharata, Bhutyanama Dharma, Dharmasya, Tadatmanam Shri Jamyaham. Whenever there's decline of righteousness, I will come forth again and again to slay the wicked, to uplift the righteous. Yeah? In the Srimad Bhagavatam, you have heard about the Dasha Avatar, you know, the ten main avatars of the Lord. But the Srimad Bhagavatam speaks of 24 avatars. It mentions 24 avatars. And actually, in the first canto, it says that infinite are his manifestations, uncountable. You cannot fathom how many incarnations there were. But amongst the 24, that the Treya is one of those 24. That the Treya is, I think, the seventh which is mentioned. And the story, just shortly, of that the Treya is his parents were Atri and Anashuya. And obviously, like in every Purana and every ancient story, there's different versions depending which Purana you take, which story you take. But essentially, Anashuya, Mata Anashuya, not Swami Anashuya, but Mata Anashuya, she was a very pious lady. Also, Swami Anashuya is a very pious man. Um, she was so pious that the gods and everybody envied her. Or like, you know, Indra, he's always afraid that somebody is going to take his position. So she was so pure and so pious that they wanted to test her. Even the devas, even the trinity wanted to test her, how pure she is. So Brahma, Vishnu and Mahesh, Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva came to Matanashuya while Atri, her husband, was out of the house and asked for biksham, asked for alms, asked to be fed. And Matanashuya obviously was more than happy to feed them. They didn't come obviously in their in their majestic God form, they came in the form of, of mercenaries or of, of beggars, of sadhus. But then they said, but we have one condition. We want you to feed us while you are naked. Because that would have broken her purity to stand in front of strangers naked that would have removed something of her purity and her chastity. So what did she do with her Shakti, with her power? She transformed Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva into children. They became small babies and like that, she like a mother removed her clothes and fed them all three without any shame or without any removing of her chastity, of her of her purity. Now the, the Trimurti was, um, well, they were now with her, they were children, and they were missing in their position to do whatever they had to do. So now Sarasvati, Parvati and Lakshmi came and begged forgiveness of Anashuya so that they might get back their husbands. Anashuya gave back the husband. She was given a boon and her boon was, 
I would like to have sons like this. I would have, I would like to have a son who is like this children, which you have, which I have just experienced and fed. And like that, that the Treya was born, that the Treya who is the combination of Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. In other versions, he's like, there were three brothers. There's Chandradev, which is Brahma, Durvasa, which is a manifestation of Rudra, of Shiva, and Dattatreya, which is a manifestation of Vishnu. So Dattatreya, as you can see, has the three heads, and he's surrounded by the four dogs, which represent the four Vedas, and he is the deity of sadhus, of uh, wandering monks. So this is, in short, the story of Dattatreya. Dattatreya had many gurus. He had 24 gurus. So in the, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, um, there's the, the Uddhava Gita, which you have, where Krishna speaks to his friend Uddhava, his last teaching after Bhagavad Gita, for sure one of the main teachings. And in the end, Krishna speaks about Dattatreya. And there's the story where a Yadu king encountered this wandering sadhu in the forest and was so amazed by his beauty, by his celestial radiance that he said like, oh, who are you? And how come you, you, are, you seem so capable, you seem so perfect, but you wander around in the forests. Um, you don't have home and you don't have family, but you seem so happy. How come? Well, when I read that, I was like, maybe because of that. Um, but that's a different point. That's my interpretation of it. But he said that the Treya said, I am always dwelling within. I'm always centered in the self. That's where my, where my happiness comes forth. So my greatest guru is the Paramatma, is the higher self. And I have 24 gurus which is probably the theme for another lecture, but they were like gurus of the nature, like the elements, the moon, the sun, a pigeon, a python, ocean, etc., etc. And he tells in that uh, account all the different lessons he has learned from those different animals and situations, which were his gurus. Okay. Um, now, Dattatreya is eternal and he has many incarnations. One of the main incarnations which is recognized and known is Sri Pada Sri Vallabha. Sri Pada Sri Vallabha was born in 1320 and took Samadhi or left in 1351. So he only lived for 30 years or 31 years. He took sannyas, he, took, he renounced everything when he was 16, so half of his years. And then he took Jal Samadhi. And he told his, his, um, his disciples that they shouldn't worry that he will still be around. Yeah, he's only leaving his mortal coil in his Tejorupa, in his energy form. He will always be around. So whoever calls upon him will get his blessings. Whoever worships his padukas, which are still there in, in his place in Karnataka, they will get his blessings. And there's also a story of a prophecy which has happened 2,498 years before the incarnation of Shivalaba. Um, it was during Ganesh Chaturthi, where great sages, great yogis have meditated in Badrikashrama, in, in Badrinath, which is one of the main shrines in the Himalaya. And they have asked uh, to get the blessings of the Lord. And the Lord has said to them that in 2,489 years, he will come in the form of a great yogi and give them darshan. And that was actually 
That's what they say, the incarnation of Sri Pada Vallabha. In that time, he also gave Kriya Yoga to them so that they can actually advance spiritually. Kriya Yoga, which is then called, which was then called Babaji Kriya, the Babaji Kriya Yoga. Yeah, so you can see there is connections between the different paths and the different great sages. After that, after that incarnation of Sri Vallabhacharya, there was Narasimha Sarasvati. Narasimha Sarasvati uh, was the son of Amba Bhavani who got blessed by Sri Pada Vallabha, the previous one, and said, he said, I will manifest in your womb again. I will become your child. So that's why this goes on saying that the material manifestation of the Tatreya, Sri Vallabha, Sri Pada Vallabha, became Narasimha Sarasvati in the womb of Amba Bhavani. He was born in 1378 and um, it is said that he is here to uplift the people from Kali Yuga, yeah, to bring the teachings in, in the Kali Yuga. So um, when he left, when he left his disciples in 1459, he said, don't feel sad. How can I bear to be away from my devotees? I only seem to leave for Sri Sailam. Sri Sailam is a place where one of the Jyotia Lingams is, where one of the main Shiva Lingams is, um, to the grosser vision of the physical. But I will ever abide at Gangapur, in this place where he was, my real state as the spirit of the real self. I will seek my noon arms in this village and accept your loving devotional service. My living presence will be experienced by anyone who bathes in the Sangam, in the confluence of the rivers, who worships the peepal tree and who venerates, uh, who takes darshan of my padukas. All of those will have my blessings. So this is, um, then he, then they prepared a little boat for him, a banana leaf basically, where he sat on and he went on the river and he was driving to the Shisailam and he said, when he arrives there, some petals will float backwards against the current to them to show them that he has safely arrived. And that was the case. These are all the stories which are being told. Yeah? And then it is said that Narasimha Swami traveled around for 150 years all over the world, China, Australia, uh, Europe, everywhere. He traveled everywhere and he came uh, to a place in the Himalayas, on the footstep of the Himalayas, where now we come to the last, to the, not the last, but the third manifestation, which is Sri Swami Samarta of Akalkot. So when he traveled around, when Narasimha Swami traveled around for 150 years, he came to this place in the Himalaya where he sat down to do his tapasya. And there he sat for at least 250, if not 300 years to do his meditation, to do his tapasya. His whole body was covered into an ant hill. And in 1800 something, I don't know exactly, 1850 something, I have to see, I have it written somewhere, a woodcutter came along and was cutting wood. And while he was cutting, suddenly he took out his axe and he saw that his axe was covered with blood. And he removed the whole anthill and everything and he found that yogi sitting there doing his tapasya. He apologized to him because the yogi came out of his meditation. He came out of his meditative state and he said, he shouldn't worry. This was all bahana. This was all meant to be so that he can now carry on and spread his mission, spread the teachings. So you see, Sri Dattatreya 
which is manifestation of God, he came as Sri Pada Vallabha, who blessed a lady to get a son, which was Narasimha Saraswati. And then Narasimha Saraswati went to do tapasya for more than 300 years. And then got awoken from his tapasya. And now we have Swami Samartha. Swami Samartha and Narasimha Swami are one and the same. That's why I mentioned those others, because if you don't know that, uh, you, 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 you don't get the point. He was not born by anybody else than by uh, Amma Bhavani, which was the mother of Narasimha Swami. You get the, the story? So, and this is actually in 1850, so it's not thousands of years ago that this story happened. So now Swami Samartha went to travel around whole India and he was known in different places uh, by, different, by different names. Um, one name is Digambar Swami. Digambar Swami because Digambar means naked. So he was just walking around naked, free, because Dattatreya is Avaduta. Avaduta means somebody who has renounced all worldly attachments, meaning also the worldly attachment of your physical body, of your identification. They are completely free beings. So he just walked around uh, freely. He was the guru of many great saints, which we know. He um, was partially guru of even Paramahamsa Ramakrishna, Shirdi Sai Baba, Gajanan Maharaj of Shergao. Many of the great Avadutas, which you maybe have heard, which we have partially in the museum, they are all inspired or they are all guided by um, also Swami Samartha, which is Tatatreya himself. So now his teachings, um, obviously one of the main teachings of Swami Samartha is humility. Humility means, what does humility mean? Humility doesn't mean, like many people think, that you have to put yourself down and you are less than anybody and people can just run over you. So humility doesn't mean, like Yuji once said, humility doesn't mean that you think you are less than anybody, but humility means that you think less about yourself and you think more of God. That means what humility is. Don't think that you are less, but think less about yourself. Be less self-centered and think more about the others. And that was one of the main teachings of Swami Samartha, truth, humility. He inspired his devotees all the time to make dharamshalas, um, refuge places, ashrams. Yeah, sounds familiar. I know somebody else who inspires his devotees to make ashrams, sanghas, oasis, places where devotees can come together so that they can grow together. You know whom I'm talking about? Yes. What's his name? Very well. Seems we are aligned. Um, Another teaching what he had, faith in the Guru, unwavering faith in the Guru. The Dattatreya tradition is a full, full blast Guru tradition. There's, their greeting is Shri Guru Datta. There's only Guru. Guru is everything. Because Guru is Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo Maheshwara, Guru Sakshat Para Brahma, Tasma Shri Guru Venama. Guru is everything. They worship, like I said, like before Sri Padavalaba says, you will have my blessings by having darshan of my padukas. You will have my blessings by thinking of me. Uh, Shri Sai Baba says, my bones will keep on talking. Just think of me, call my name, I will be there. It's all Guru-centric. It's all God manifests in a mortal coil and becomes the Guru. And to have faith in the Guru is the utmost important 
ingredient to advance on a spiritual path. And that was the teaching also of Swami Samartha. And there's tons of accounts where people have received his blessings and his grace. Knowledge of the self. Again, these are all teachings which we also get. Yeah, Humility, who teaches it? Guruji teaches it. Faith in the Guru, who teaches it? Guru teaches it. Uh, knowledge of the self. How many times has Guruji mentioned lately that you have to know yourself? There's no point about speaking about love for God and realizing God if you don't know who you truly are. And loving yourself, knowing yourself, endeavoring in this journey from the mind to the heart is something which also Swami Samartha has repeatedly or mostly inspired people. Also by his, by his presence, like uh, it is said that in all locations, in all circumstances, he was always absorbed in himself. He was always like, they could see him either completely naked or sometimes dressed up like a prince. Like you will see pictures of him where he's like dressed up in ornaments. It looks really weird because, sorry, no, no, no offense, but I found it, I found it weird when I saw the picture. I'm like, what is this? Like fully covered. He lived in palaces. Sometimes he was staying in palaces. And other times he was seen living on the garbage place, on the rubbish himself, on the rubbish itself, completely indifferent to pleasure, pain, to high and low, to riches, to like the Gunatita in the Bhagavad Gita is mentioned. No, the one who sees uh, clay and gold as the same, it all doesn't matter for him. He has, he's an avaduta. He has transcended the whole material world. Um, at sometimes, most of the times, he speaks very sweetly. And then there were times where he just becomes super abusive. Like his speech, very, very abusive. When I read that, I was like, yeah, that sounds familiar. <laughs> that sounds familiar. Yeah. Um, I guess you know whom I mean. Um, he encouraged people to see God in everything, Samadarshana. Yeah? The all pervading reality, Narayana is in everything. And for that, obviously, you need first humility. You need to have the Guru, you need to have the faith in the Guru so that you can actually get to know who you truly are. And the more you know who you truly are, the more you will see that what you are is also what the others are. And like that, you will see God in everything. Like the Krishna says in, Krishna says in chapter 5 of the Bhagavad Gita, seeing a dog, a dog eater, or a priest, or a Brahmin, as the same. In the eyes of God, we are all the same, seeing this all-pervading reality behind everything, one of his main teachings. And finally, everything always culminates in bhakti. So even if um, you read the, the Datta tradition, uh, the, the Datta Gita even, there's, there's even a uh, a discourse of Tathatreya, which is uh, philosophically, you have to know how to take it because it's, it's otherwise confusing for devotees. But the point is, even in those traditions, bhakti is always on the highest point. <gasps> devotion for God, devotion for the Guru, devotion is that which will finally liberate you. And Swami Samartha always said that... Um, the mind is a very powerful storehouse. Yeah, we all know the mind is very powerful. That's why he encouraged to do, 
people to do what? Again, you see, the teachings are so similar, are so partially the behavior is similar, and the teachings are also similar. The only thing which you might not experience is Guruji walking around like a digumber, like walking around naked. I haven't experienced that yet. But otherwise, there's quite a lot of parallel things where he's like, one time like this, one time like this, one time he's sweet, one time he's harsh, one time he's, we are in India and in some island and we live in the, in the mud and then another time we are in some uh, palace almost. And it's all the same. It's all okay. So bhakti is the highest teaching which also Swami Samartha has given. Chant the name of God or chant the name of the Guru, which they mainly did. You will see the devotees of uh, Swami Samartha, they will chant the name of the Guru constantly. Now, when I was in India on Girnar, Girnar is the place uh, in Gujarat where Dattatreya appeared, where he did his meditation. It's a mountain, there's 10,000 steps which lead up to it. And on the top, Dattatreya was sitting as a small shrine. And you see people sitting there and just chanting, Om Shri Swami Samartha, Om Shri Swami Samartha. And uh, so bhakti and the, the taming of the mind through Japam is something of the main teachings in this tradition. One of the main scriptures, if you're interested a little bit about the lives of um, Sri Pada Vallabha, uh, Narasimha Swami, and also Samartha Swami. Well, Samartha Swami, there's a separate book about his biography. But otherwise, there's the Guru Charitra, the Guru Charitra, which speaks mainly about the incidents and the miracles of Sri Pada Vallabha and Narasimha Swami. It is somehow divided into these three parts. It's literally like a little bit like the, the Vedas are divided in the Karmakanda and the Jnanakanda. So also the Guru Charitra is kind of the knowledge part where the teachings are given, the Karma part where the actions or how to act and the Bhakti part. Yeah? The Bhakti Kanda, Karmakanda and Jnanakanda. The miracles of Sri Swami Samartha. There's well whole books about his his doings, about his miracles. Um, some of them are like saving a devotee from from death. There's the, the saying that uh, Baba Saheb Jadav, uh, which was a great devotee of Baba, once came to Baba, and by seeing him, the Swami Samatha said, O oh Potter, there's a summon coming in your name, a summon coming in your name. And this Potter, this disciple, immediately understood that that means he's summoned by Yamraj. He, like that is approaching him. And so he fell at the feet of Swami Samatha and he asked him that he takes away death from him because he wants to keep on serving him while he is still here. And in that moment, uh, Swami Samartha said not to worry and a bull was flying by or a buffalo was flying by and Swami Samartha looked up towards the sky, mumbled something, like probably he had this darshan look where he does like thing and moves his lips, also something which we know from somewhere, right? Uh, and then he said, addressing somebody invisible, he said, go to the bull and in the presence of all the devotees, that bull instantly fell dead. And in that way, he saved the devotee from that. He transferred the death of the devotee to the bull. 
restoring a dry well. I like this story very much where Swami Samarta uh, on a very hot summer noon, he walked into the house of, of a devotee and asked for some drinking water. But as the well of the, of the devotees of that lady there was dry because it was Indian summer, scorching hot, uh, she went to the neighbor to ask for some water. And Swami Samatha was just laughing at this because he said that the well is not dry. And they said, yes, the well is absolutely dry. And he walked over to the well and he started to urinate next to the well. <laughs> and the well was overflown with water. <laughs> Yeah, they have quite some, some un, uh, how you say, unorthodox ways sometimes. There's another story of, not Swami Samarta, I think it, it was uh, Bal Yogi, I don't know exactly. Because you see, in the, in, the, in the Datta tradition, there's many gurus, there's many expansions of Datta Treya. Like I said, Shri Sai Baba and many other Shirga, uh, Swami Gajanan Maharaj. And they are actually almost everywhere, Guruji said. Yeah, these Avadutas, you go to the villages, you see those beggars? Well, most of them might be just beggars. But amongst them, there might be the one, the one which is actually an Avaduta. And one of uh, this. Uh, Bal Yogi, I think, was when his disciple came um, and he was standing on the balcony. He asked him for a blessing for his shop. And also there, he just took it out and urinated on his devotee, which was staying down, just to experience that afterwards, everything what he wanted increased. His business increased. Everything what he wanted was fulfilled. But yeah, if you see something like that, you would think like, what is this? Like, this is, this is absolute out outrageous, isn't it? Um, omnipresence. So it's said that one time he was traveling, departure, like the names of the places. I don't even bother to tell them to you because I think it doesn't really matter. Mangala Veda, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, it was very hot and he was traveling around barefoot and he passed by a field where he met two farmers. And so he asked one of them if he could borrow the slippers or if he could get the slippers from them. And one offered him his slippers. And so Baba took the slippers and walked off. And after some time, the other farmer told the first one, what did you do? Your only pairs of slippers. Our parents will scold you now that you gave away the slippers. And so he, he said it so much that he started to regret that he actually gave him the slippers. In that moment, Baba just came back, gave him the slippers and walked away. And they thought that he has just walked a little distance and has come back because he has come back, obviously, because of that prayer, because of this regret that he didn't want to give it, that he felt remorse of giving something. But then it was said that he was actually seen in Solapur, which is a place at a complete different distance, doing there his thing. So location, omnipresence. He was never seen at this place anymore because obviously the devotion was not there. But omnipresence, which again is something which we can see uh, and have experienced some of you, I guess, with Guruji also. I remember I have experienced it when I, many years back when we were in Vienna to have um, we were at Yamuna Shri's house actually, and we had some dinner, I think it was 2009. And we're having dinner, just 
normal sitting on the table talking about normal things. And at some point, Guiji just interrupted or was not present anymore. He had this, exactly this look, like just looking up, forgetting everything around and mumbling something. And I stopped talking because I felt like he is not really with me anymore. And after 30 seconds, he just came back and he was like, <sighs> what did you say? I said, no, no, nothing. You tell me what, what's, what's happening? What's going on over there? Yeah. And he said, no, no, nothing. Just some devotee who asked me for help. Oh, okay. Maybe elaborate a little bit. Yeah. But he doesn't because obviously, yeah, you know, they normally don't tell what they do in their private time or on the other places because the guru is constantly working for us, constantly. There's not one second that he is not working for us. The next day, Malti from South Africa called me. She was super agitated and she said like, I need to talk to Guruji, I need to talk to Guruji. I said, yeah, but Guruji is not available right now. What is it? What's, what's going on? I need to talk to him. I need to thank him. I said, why? What happened? She said, yesterday, my brother had something on the brain. I don't know exactly what it was. And he had to go in immediate surgery. So they brought him into the, into the hospital. And while he they were bringing him, it was obviously a dangerous situation working on the brain. He was constantly just praying to Guruji, please help me, please help me, please help me. And they brought him into the place. They gave him the anesthetics. And while they were giving him the anesthetics, he looked up. And whom did he see instead of the doctor? Guruji. Everything went well. The operation went well. He's fine. He's healthy. And I need to speak to Guruji. I need to thank him. And I'm like... I was quite fresh to the whole Bhakti Marga and also Guruji, even though I have seen many things, that was a bit weird because, yeah, sometimes people are also on ground. I said like, yeah, Malti, it's, I, it's not possible because I'm here with him in Austria. And she's like, I'm telling you, he saw him and everything went well, something which cannot happen. And I asked her, when was this? When, what was the time that this situation happened? She told me the exact time. I did the calculation from America to Austria, and guess what? It was the time where we were sitting on the dinner table, having some, just some chat, and he just looks up into the sky, says, ah, nothing, just some devotee who asks me for help. Omnipresence of the Guru, omnipresence also here, uh, Samartha Swami. Omniscience. The story, uh, there was a devotee who had a friend who was a great doubter. He was quite arrogant because he had a lot of knowledge. And he doubted Swami Samartha, he doubted the gurus in general, and one night this man had a dream of a hundred scorpions biting him or stinging him. And he woke up from that dream like very fearful, like very frightened. The next day they went to Swami Samartha and there was a satsang and they asked questions. So this man asked the question of Brahmakara Vritti, which means like a state where you are constantly centered in Brahman, in the Absolute. And Swami Samartha said, what do you want to know about Brahmakara Vritti? You can't even distinguish between a dream and reality or what happened when all the scorpions stinged you in your dream? Did you not get very scared 
And in that moment, this man understood that Swami Samartha knows exactly what happens in his dreams, what happens in this reality. And again, this is something which I think so many people have experienced where you dream of Guruji and he tells you something and then he might respond to you to your prayer. Uh, you might have heard the story of Swami Ravatikanta when he was praying in his room that he wanted to stay in the bungalow. He wanted to stay in the cellar of Guruji to have just a mattress there, to, to live there and stay there. And then Guruji calls him over for dinner and when he rings the bell, Guruji opens the door and he looks at him, no, you cannot stay in my cellar. Yeah, he's just omnipresent. He knows what is going on. There was the, and, and that's the most beautiful thing. If you start to ask people how they got to Bhakti Marga, how they met Guruji, you can really see that he's, yeah, he's all pervading, omniscient. I remember uh, once when I went with my, once when I went to Italy to meet friends, old friends, I wanted to show them, I told to the Chinese devotees the story, I wanted to show them that I'm not, that I'm still feeling I'm still as good as I was before because everybody when I met Guruji was against my choice to follow the spiritual path, which maybe you also experienced that some people are not really happy for your life. They're actually against it or even afraid because you, because there's some intensity, you know? And so also my old friends, they were very uh, opposing to this whole thing. And I thought, okay, when I meet them, I need to show them that I'm actually in a very good mood. I'm in a very good state, even though I was not. Because when you meet your guru, what happens also, the work starts. And when the work starts, it's also normal that you have times of just contemplation, quietness, and redefining who you are and what is going on in life, right? It's not just, oh yes, let's party and let's pretend. But I thought, let me pretend for this evening so that they don't get the wrong idea because I have, I'm not open for some discussions. So we went to this restaurant and I walked in and I was very like joyful, joyful and happy and hello and yeah. And I was telling about, about the ashram and telling a lot of different things. And while I was telling them how exciting everything is and how happy I am and how good everything is, my phone ringed. And guess who called me? I picked up and I'm like, oh, Guji. And that would obviously, if I pick up this phone call now in the assembly of my friends, that would obviously remove the masquerade because I'm not picking up and like, hey, Guruji, what's up? Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. No, uh, it's like, Jai yeah. yeah, It's going to be very obvious, submissive, like the guru, right? And that's exactly what they had an issue with. So... What are you going to do with that? So I just, just one second, and I walked <laughs> over in a corner, and I'm like, Jay Gurudev. And he doesn't even say Jay Gurudev. He's just like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, what do you mean, what's wrong with me? Why are you so ungrounded? Why are you so uncentered? Center yourself. Don't pretend. And I'm like, Okay, what's going on here? Like, we are thousands of miles apart, but still, he perceives exactly what is going on. And like this, we have experienced many things, no? Like, uh, once there was a darshan in, in Verona, and I invited my brother to come. And he said, well, if I finish my, my chores before, then I, I will come. Um, if I can leave before 
10 o'clock, I will come. Darshan went on, and at 11 o'clock, I remembered about my brother. I told nobody, because why would I? It's for him to come for Darshan. So I called him, and I said, so what, what about you? Are you coming? He said, yeah, yeah, I'm starting now, which is a two hours drive, basically. I said, yeah, but you said at 10 o'clock. Yeah, I couldn't leave before I'm coming now. And I thought, like, I'm not sure if the Darshan is going to last till you arrive. But okay, as you're on the way, I won't. I won't discourage you because at least you will meet him, you will talk to him maybe, maybe we have dinner together, whatever. So just come. So Darshan was going on and Darshan was getting to an end. And when the Darshan finished, this was also quite some years ago, we didn't have yet such amazing musicians like we have nowadays. Guruji started to sing a bhajan. And out of that bhajan, he started to make a medley. So he made one bhajan, he went to the next bhajan, and then he went to the next bhajan, just keeping on singing. And I was like, wow, he's really enjoying that. And I'm telling you, the music was not good. It's just what it is. They were not great musicians. It's like this, yeah? Like the djembe was just like, like whenever he wants to speed up, it doesn't speed up because the djembe is just, it's just like, I'm like, strange, strange, because he normally, you know which kind of music he likes, which kind of bhajan he likes, no? He likes to energetic. And he just went on and went on and sung and sung and sung. And at some point, Bajan was finished. I went there, I lighted the arti lamp because I thought now arti. And he looked at me and said, no, no. And he started the next bhajan. And again, tukutung, tukutung, tukutung. And he sang and sang and sang. And during the second bhajan, which I don't know how long it lasted, at some point, he looked at me and did like, I'm like. <laughs> so I went over and he said like, go get your brother. And I'm like, get your brother? W what do you mean? I completely forgot. He said, he's waiting for you. So I went out from the hall, there's downstairs. The moment I walk out of the hall, who walks in by the main entrance? My brother. And I'm saying, well, Guruji, I think he's just waiting for you. Please come. So walked him up and in the assembled darshan, he walked in front all by himself. He got darshan and after he got darshan, now arti. Yeah? How did he know that my brother is about to come? How did he know that my brother was arrived? How did he know? Well, he knows. Healing. Uh, the story is about a lady called Saku who lost her job from a cunning landlord and then she went around just begging for arms, just surviving basically, till she got sick and she couldn't anymore go around begging, she couldn't get any more enough to sustain herself and her treatment. So one of the devotees of Samartha, Swami Samartha, took her to Akalkot to be in the presence of Swamiji. She never complained. She just had one prayer. Please, God, give me the strength to endure what I have to endure. Give me the strength. So she went to Swami Samartha. She stayed there. She didn't even ask him for anything because she thought and understood that just being in his presence is an amazing grace. So she stayed there and out of nowhere, Swami Samartha just gave her some paste, a stone to make out the paste, told her to apply it, and obviously she was healed through this remedy which Swami Samartha gave her. Again, healing, which I think many of you have experienced, or at least many people have experienced. I have seen it so many times. I remember when he went to Mauritius, 
the first years when he went to Mauritius, it was really the temple suddenly got filled because obviously when Guiji comes, the temple gets filled. And he just took the whole day or days where he was sitting in the temple and people were just coming one by one by one by one. And he, he healed them of the most weird and incurable things ever. He was like a miracle doctor. Funny enough that not all the people are as grateful as this lady, which is mentioned here. Some of them you never saw again. There was one lady who got healed from, from I think even Guruji told in, in his satsang, which had like uh, cancer in the end phase. And she went to him and she asked for for healing to take care of her children till they grow up and whatever. And so Guruji prayed for her, gave her a remedy and she was healed. Like something impossible happened. End state of cancer and she was completely healed. And one day she came to the, to the temple when Guruji was there in a very inappropriate way. And Guruji just told her, why you don't dress in an appropriate way when you come to the temple? And she said, Swamiji, you see, I have now a second life and I'm enjoying it. And Guruji looked at her and said, you better don't forget why you got this second life. You got this second life to take care of your children and you got an opportunity to grow. Also, this will have an end. Yeah, you might laugh now, but I don't know how long you will laugh. Yeah, we have the chance to, because what is true healing? Yeah, but like, okay, I want to mention that because sometimes now some people might think, yeah, but I didn't get healed. Or I know people also who didn't get healed because I know people who didn't get healed physically. Even our great brother, which maybe some of long-term devotees knows, Dharmananda. Yeah, he was a great brother who lived with Guruji for many years. He was a monk. He, he was a great musician. And from one day after the other, he got diagnosed with, I don't know which cancer, but a very powerful one. And within months, he deteriorated completely. And he was in the, in the, in the safety of Guruji. He was with Guruji. He came to Guruji. He didn't ask him for healing, but he was with Guruji and Guruji took care of him. In the end, I think that's also something which Guruji told. We told the story sometimes. We went to his place when he was about to leave and we went all in there singing. He was lying on his bed. He couldn't even talk anymore. He was just like, bones and skin. It was really impressive to see because he was, a, he was taller than me and bigger than me. And he was just lying there and he could barely move anything. And we were just there singing, but you could see the joy he has, the radiance he has. He asked Guruji to see, to know who he truly is. And like Guruji said in the latest Satsang, I couldn't refuse him. I don't know if he said that in, in Hungary or somewhere. In that moment, I couldn't refuse to show him something more. And then, but what we saw was only that he suddenly, Dharmananda was lying in his bed and with this last strength, he was like putting his hand over and he wanted to, to go to the feet of Guruji. And Guruji said, no. And he put up his feet on the bed. <laughs> yeah. Best. <laughs> Few out. <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> A few hours later, he was gone, but he got his wish fulfilled because what is true healing? True healing is not the 
body. Yeah, there's the story of the 10 blind men who go to Christ and ask him to be healed. And Christ heals all 10 of them. But one comes back and falls at his feet and says, you are my Lord, you are my life. And what does Christ say? Today, your faith has truly healed you. Because the true healing is not this physical coil which needs to be healed. Even though Guruji many times heals it, if it's necessary, if it's for the benefit of the higher healing, of the deeper healing. And so also in the life of Swami Samartha, there's many instances like that. If you ask Giri Kumar, one of the brahmacharis who take care of the cows, he will be your best doctor because whenever he had any problem, like from the age he went to Guruji and Guruji told him, eat red onion and his ailment disappeared. And then I noticed that Giri Kumar started to instruct people when they had some ailments, he was saying, just eat red onion. And I told Guruji and he was laughing so hard. He was like, he really believes the onion is helping him. It is not the onion which helps you. It is the blessing which is within the instruction of the master. Samadhi, he took Samadhi in 1878 um, when he was traveling around, like I said, for many time, but then he settled in Akalkot and he stayed there for 24 years. That's why he is called Swami Samartha of Akalkot. And basically after almost 600 years of his existence, yes, Sri Padavallabha Narasimha Swami, uh, Samartha Swami, this, this lineage in that sense kind of finished, it didn't finish because there's obviously many, the Guru Parampara goes on, but um, this direct incarnation in that sense is said to, to finish there. Um, he adopted Mahasamadhi under the banyan tree, under his favorite banyan tree, which you can see there. We went there with Guruji, we have him in the museum, we have some belongings of Swami Samartha also. I think also of the others of Sripada Vallabha, also of Narasimha Swami. We even have uh, a piece of stone from, from the place in Girnar where Dattatreya was meditating because uh, I think Swamini Mohini uh, arranged something. And the devotees still experience his presence because he has said, uh, I'm not gone, I'm still here. Like Ramakrishna Paramahamsa when, when he took Samadhi and Sharada Devi wanted to remove her bangles of marriage, uh, Ramakrishna, she just heard the voice and says like, what are you doing? I just moved from one room to another room. Yeah, I'm not limited. Like Guruji says, when I will be gone, I will be not gone. I will be even more able to guide you all in my omnipresence. He took Jivan Samadhi and he proclaimed that no one should weep. I shall always be present at all places and I shall respond to every call of the devotees. So, summary. Swami Samartha is a manifestation of Dattatreya, Dattatreya, which is one of the incarnations of Mahavishnu. He had 24 gurus, one of the main incarnations of Dattatreya was Sri Pada Vallabha and who blessed Amabhavani to get a son, to get him as a son, which then became Narasimha Sarasvati, who then left the place and went to do Tapasya in Himalayas and got covered by an anthill for 300 years and then got rediscovered and came to be known as Swami Samartha of Akalkot. The main scripture, what they have, or the main life which is told about them is the 
Sri Guru Charitra and well life and miracles we have spoken a little bit about Sri Guru Datta Jagadev. <laughs> <laughs>